Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's episode, we've got an action-packed agenda for you. We've got the CEO, Paul Prager of TerraWolf. This is one of the most followed and popular companies we cover on the channel. We brought Anthony Power along as well, our resident Bitcoin mining analyst, to talk about earnings and the strategy or outlook for 2024 for this top miner. Now, before we get into all that, please take a second, hit the like button, you guys. It's a huge help to myself, the channel, Anthony absolutely loves it and it helps push this content to other people like you who may find value. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. We're almost at the 43,000 subscriber milestone. We'd love to have you as part of the community. And finally, you guys, let us know in the comments section below if you're part of the Wolf Pack, if you're holding shares at TerraWolf, your thoughts on this company heading into having and your outlook for 2024. Now, with that being said, let's get into today's interview. Okay guys, so that's right. Today's video, much anticipated, very exciting. We've got the leader of the Wolfpack himself, Paul Prager, joining us on the channel to give an update, not only on earnings, but strategy for 2024, having growth, all things TerraWolf related. So Paul, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Pleasure to be here. I nice see you guys. For sure it is. Anthony, we haven't forgotten about you down there. You're, uh, you're welcome to the channel as well. Our resident Bitcoin mining analyst, here to help ask some of the more difficult questions. So we'll get right into it, Paul. Uh, for people who maybe missed our initial coverage, can you just give us a quick high-level summary of TerraWolf and uh, your current operations? Sure. Wolf is a team of executives working together for decades, building and operating energy infrastructure. Decades of experience in energy supply optimization, ops, and engineering. Uh, we built out Mara's original facility uh, at Hardin, uh, we decided we wanted to be able to manage a Bitcoin mining business run it our way. Uh, part of that way is being zero carbon. So we have two facilities, one in New York, currently 160 megawatts, one in Pennsylvania or Nuke at 50 megawatts, they're low cost, 95% zero carbon, completely scalable sites. Great. These two facilities are industrial scale. Uh, with a combined self-mining hash rate of around 8 exahash per second, facilitated by approximately 50,000 currently deployed miners. Uh, we have the highest level of management and insider ownership, I think, in the space, uh, approximately 40%. Great. Thanks for the quick intro there, Paul. The insider ownership, I'm glad you brought that up. We were going to touch on that a little bit later. Now, I know you just came out with Q4 results and fiscal year 2023. We won't go through that in depth here, but can you give us just some of the highlights, uh, in your opinion, from last year's performance? Uh, I think 2023 was a remarkable year for the Wolf. Uh, we negotiated and amended our debt to remove fixed principal amort. Uh, utilizing free cash flow suite to rapidly reduce our debt balance. I think our CFO, Patrick, has talked a lot about that. Um, we commenced mining at Nautilus. We built and deployed two additional buildings at Lake Mariner. Uh, we increased our operating capacity by 300% to 210 megawatts and almost 8 exahash. Uh, we've repaid over 40 million of debt. We positioned the company with an additional 20 million of excess liquidity so we could navigate you know, the near having. Uh, and we've delivered a cost to mine that's amongst the lowest relative to any other publicly listed mining company out there. We're producing Bitcoin at approximately 25,000 per Bitcoin pre-having. Uh, it'll be around 37,000 post-having. You know, at these levels, we're making like half a million a day. That's excellent. No, I mean, you, you mentioned about the debt there, Paul, and um, we've seen the likes of um, Bit Farms who... 20 months ago had about $160 million of debt on their balance sheet and they've managed to get that down to zero by February. They had a plan to do that. We've stopped, we start to hear about your initial plan and you start to pay down some large chunks. But what's the plan post the halving to, to get that debt down to more manageable levels? Um, it's one of the questions that came up so many times in, in this last few weeks um, with regards to that. I think it's the sort of like the one part that shareholders you know, want to you know, have some sort of like understanding of how you're going to do it um, and, 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 and what, are the, what are the methods for doing that? Yeah. First of all, I want to take issue with your comment, getting it down to manageable levels. 
we're at manageable levels day one because we make money mining, unlike most of the guys you have on this show. We have plenty of excess free cash flow. We make money mining. That's why we can repay debt. So currently, we're focused on maximizing cash flow, reducing debt, and ultimately taking it out completely. To that end, we've already made significant strides in debt reduction. We repaid $40 million the last few months, four months. We plan another pay down of about $30 million early April, a couple of weeks. We will bring the debt balance to $76 million, and with the cash on the balance sheet, you know, our net debt is $55 million. Bucks. Um, we're generating, and by the way, that is readily financeable in the market, though our plan is to completely play it, pay it off with excess cash flow. I'm generating 500 to 600,000 of free cash flow a day. If Bitcoin stays where it is, or it continues to move north, we're gonna keep harvesting our cash flow. And I would expect we pay off the debt sometime in the third, late in the third or early fourth quarter. In terms of our balance sheet, Anthony, we have excellent excess liquidity of about 20 million bucks to navigate through the halving. Uh, and that should be able to help us address any volatility over the next couple of months. Thanks, Paul. We actually just put out a podcast yesterday talking about how optimistic we were about Q1 and the revenue projections, the daily revenue. So to hear you saying those kind of numbers is just absolutely mind blowing. And and I'm sure your team is so excited to see an all time having or all time high before the having as we were. Um, the next question we got from the audience, Paul, it, it has to do with actually growth. And and you mentioned as you uh, go through the having, your fleet will become more efficient. That's why the thirty seven thousand dollar approximate Bitcoin price. But one of the questions we had was for building four at Lake Mariner, uh, you guys chose to put in the S19 JXPs um, as opposed to a T21 or an S21. We were just curious on that. Was that just a timing or, or PO delivery type of thing? Well, that's not right. I mean, we've used the S19 JXPs for building three, and that was the latest generation miner at the time we purchased the miners for building three back in July. We are using the S21s for building four, which we expect will complete construction midsummer. Okay, thanks for the correction there. So moving forward, S21s will be the new standard for all growth for you guys? Correct. Got it. Moving on to sort of like onto sort of growth in the company, um, you know, we, we've seen what you what your plans are to get to, to the middle of this year. What are the fu future growth uh, plans to get you once you've achieved that 10 extra hash? and the sites that you've got occupied at the moment, what are the growth in those sites? And are you looking at further sites or even geographical sites um, to expand the company in the next 18 months? Yeah. Um, in terms of expansion, we're currently at 210 megawatts. We're committed to achieving 300 megawatts infrastructure capacity in operation by year end 2024 with plans to expand further to 550 megawatts by 2025. That's approximately 28 exahash, assuming current generation miners. Um, we're evaluating HPC and AI to optimize utilization and value our extensive proprietary infrastructure. Anthony, when you have what you have at home, you don't have to go shopping for it. So we could just build out our existing sites and it will take us some time and we'll do it at a lower cost and we'll make more money than anybody else. As I think about funding the growth, we have far more flexibility in sourcing capital today given our current positive cash flow, right? And as I said before, because um, we're not in denial on it, we would expect to use the ATM strategically to fund incremental growth and development, but we're disciplined and patient about it. Uh, we're able to fund only when it's attractive and a creative stock price is available to us. So that's how I think about growth. I mean, yeah. we have the most experienced M&A team in the industry, right? And we've been together a long time, right? Nasser was at Evercore, Terry was at Goldman, Stephanie was at Paul Weiss, Patrick was at Blackstone. Uh, I've unfortunately been around the block a little bit. We have great M&A skill sets, but right now the focus has to be on building out our own sites where we could do it for less money, more quickly, and that's the value of scalable energy infrastructure.
And is the is the um, is the is the power obviously available at those sites to to grow yeah, that necessarily? Absolutely, a hundred percent readily available. Which is obviously the key the key part of Bitcoin mining. Um, we I mean we talked about I mean you're only going to use ATM when it's accretive and and. You know, I used to talk a couple of years ago about, you know, the three options or the three levers for, for mining companies. You know, they can sell Bitcoin to fund, they can they can raise by debt and they can um, dilute shares. Are you are you seeing, you know, any potential for companies to go back into, um, you know, look to the banks or to, uh, look, looking at debt um, on the balance sheet to, to grow? Or do you think now the model that's been, you know, that's been used across most of the mining companies um, from a dilution perspective, is is the way to to do it, and and maybe look at like what the clean spark of models been over the last uh, two years to grow to where they are. Well, I'm not sure you and I would agree on what's been going on and whether or not it's been good for the space. I mean, I I kind of find um, non accretive growth and dilution of shareholders um, to be an unfortunate reality of public Bitcoin mining stocks. That is not what Wolf is about, okay? So I think that the debt markets are coming along. Um, I think that um, for those that make money and can demonstrate they make money, then debt would be available. But, you know, I don't think that's in our cards right now. I think that we're just going to use the money that we make because we have such a substantial margin and pay off our debt. Um, I want to challenge you, though, to get people on the show and let them show you what their absolute costs are. I mean, you have every Bitcoin miner. I, I haven't heard one CEO get on the show and say, these are my costs and verify it, audit it. Every single cost is accounted for when Patrick says we're making half a million a day. We're making half a million a day. There are no secret hidden. Oh, we left that out or we didn't. That's a footnote. That's crap, and I think too many public Bitcoin miners do that. That's not what Wolf does. In terms of opportunity for saucing capital, again, I think debt's available for a guy that is a proven moneymaker. I think that discrete use of the ATM, when it's strategic, uh, when issuance is without a doubt accretive, um, I think that's, that's important for us. ATM use is strategic. For so many of our peers, I find it systematic, where they're just issuing 10 to 20% of volume every single day. You won't have that with us. That's not what we do. Um, when I say we exercise extremely prudent management of our ATM facility, that means we are strategically selling shares only when there could be a discernibly accretive impact for the proceeds like for an essential miner or infrastructure capex. Uh, we're now in a position where creative investment in our equipment infrastructure has produced for us very significant cash flow. You saw that in our results. Um, when it comes to ATMs, I think a lot of our peers out there are, you know, they seem to be a lot more about lifestyle companies for the management at the expense of shareholders. You know, at the end of my earnings, I said, you know, a cute old joke, which is, how do you make a small fortune in Bitcoin mining? And for me, um, I think if you're looking at some of our peers out there, start with a much bigger fortune because they may have a war chest that they're digging into every month because they're mining at a loss. That's not us. I can assure you, as one of the largest shareholders of Wolf, that that is not the way we will run this company. We're here to make money for our shareholders. I mean, at the end of the day, Paul, the, the, the bottom line is, is you know, we're all judged on, 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 on earnings when they come out and people can say what they want in between those earnings, as we hear and as you've articulated to. But the only metric that matters is the, is the, is the bottom line. So thanks for, thanks for informing us on that. I, I had one for you too, Paul. I was going to ask kind of about that parameter or strategy with the ATM. I feel like you've you've more or less answered that one. But speaking of investors, shareholders, yourself being the biggest one, I know you mentioned a lot of insider ownership. Are you getting approached by institutional investors? Are we starting to see institutions come into TerraWolf as well? Yeah. Um, you know, I think all of a sudden we're getting some traction in our messaging. Uh, we're grateful for that. Um 
we will always be loyal to to the retail customer that that has been with us since day one really patient and they've dealt with a lot of crap and we are very grateful for their continued ownership but we're getting massive institutional inbounds um it's never been higher uh we had a couple of, of our folks dazzer and patrick recently attended the Roth conference they had 15 one-on-one meetings with nearly the entire uh, institutional investor base, all new to the Wolf story. Um, generally, uh, what I'm seeing is institutions that are completing analysis on all Bitcoin miners. Uh, they've got their shopping lists, I think, ready to go. Uh, if not currently invested in the space, the institutions have indicated they want to be positioned to participate uh, in any post-having volatility. Um, I think the advent of the ETFs has redirected institutional focus towards the miners, um, with Wolf distinguishing itself due to our status as the lowest marginal producer with an unwavering commitment to financial transparency and ESG. I don't think anybody else is even close to Patrick in sort of setting the bar for transparency. Uh, he was first and still remains on top of that, uh, on top of the peer group. And our ESG principles are at the very core of what we do. And I think that's important for institutional investment. Uh, I think as we continue to reduce our debt, which has been rapid, um, and we adhere to a proven commodity practice that I don't think Anthony appreciates as much as he should, which is we monetize what we mine, uh, we anticipate a surge in institutional interest following the release of our second and third quarter results. Um, as one of the most profitable miners in the market with ongoing scalability in-house uh, and substantial potential in the HPC AI market, I believe Wolf represents a very exciting prospect for institutional investors seeking long-term value. And you mentioned Q2, Q3. Is that just because they want to see how the halving shakes out, Paul? Uh, as opposed, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think post having, uh, they're gonna. You know, it will be like a hammer on the head of look at the earnings, look who can't continue to operate all that exahash, and and there's gonna be the wolf, and we're knocking it down thirty six thousand, thirty seven thousand Bitcoin a day. You know, a Bitcoin cost, and they're gonna be like, wow. But you've, you're gonna, I mean, we're gonna see quarter one probably the next couple of months, and uh, or, or the first three months of twenty twenty four where people have had. The opportunity to benefit um, when we're mining 900 coins a day. So, you know, it's, we, we had a podcast yesterday where we looked at like, you know, the potential revenues and it was more those aimed at the companies that were, were hodling at the moment and the benefits they're going to achieve in a rising Bitcoin. Um, is, 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 is hodling something that um, that terrible will, will look to in the future? Is it a case of your goal now is to, is, is as you've articulated already, is to grow um, and get to that position. Hey, I, I, you know, I, first of all, I'm big fans of you guys, but I am not a fan of, of some of the comments that, uh, have been on the show regarding hodling. Um, I just don't see it that way. Um, so I'm appreciative, Anthony, of, of your open-mindedness and asking me, I think it was a very good marketing strategy by some of the larger miners. It helped create an early sort of cult-like followings that help drive stock price appreciation uh, early on. Uh, I owned a lot of marathon shares at one point, um, and I'm glad they hodled when they did because we were a direct beneficiary when I sold the shares. Ironically, uh, their former head of corporate communications, Jason, works for me now, and he was involved in creating that strategy to begin with. But I think Patrick and I uh, Kerry, we've all been very clear. We monetize our Bitcoin like pretty much every other commodity business in the world does. I personally believe it's entirely disingenuous and irresponsible to gamble and speculate with shareholders' money while simultaneously diluting them by issuing hundreds of millions of shares at the same time. I think with the advent of multiple ETFs, the HODL strategy makes even less sense considering investors and institutions can simply invest directly in the asset, as opposed to buying a miner who's speculating on the behalf and probably mining at a loss. If you want to own Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin through an ETF. If you want to buy the miner that mines it the most profitably, 
you should buy Wolf. Now, Paul... Oh, uh, not, uh, not a fan of the uh, Michael, Stratton, Michael Saylor strategy at the moment, then, take it. Michael's a different animal, and he's a pal of mine. You know, he lives, he lives across the river from me here on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. And I think he's been absolutely fantastic. But I would argue he's much more similar to an ETF or a fund. He's not a miner. That was going to be my next question, Paul, is, is if uh, if there isn't an appetite for that hodl, how do you explain the micro strategy success? But you have articulated they're in a different class of their own. Um, I, too, have been a big fan of the hodl for a long, long time. However, I will give you credit now, Paul, with Bitcoin price where it is. I definitely feel a lot better about the daily selling or the selling now as opposed to sixteen, eighteen, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 Bitcoin, right? You got to do what you got to do depending upon who you are. I'm a Bitcoin mining company. I'm no different than any other company that that generates a commodity, right? And what we do is we monetize it. If you just want to own Bitcoin, buy an ETF. Don't buy Wolf. But if you want to buy a company that is profitable in generating Bitcoin, buy Wolf. That's very fair. Now, switching gears a little bit, Paul, and I appreciate how direct you are here, and I think a lot of the audience really does appreciate that. This is one of the companies that you can consistently see positive cash flow, which I think a lot of people are attracted to. Um, you were mentioned a little bit earlier, Paul, HPC and AI, and we've seen a lot of buzz around this in the Bitcoin mining space. Is that an area, or I, I guess just talk to us about the opportunities you see there. Is that something we can expect in 2024? Yeah, I think there's no doubt investments in cloud infrastructure by prominent hyperscalers, you know, the Magnificent Seven, if you will, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they've experienced exponential growth over the past five years. Um, we are an energy infrastructure company, and we are blessed in that we are long infrastructure when there's a mass scramble for infrastructure now among the miners and hyperscalers. Um, hyperscalers are extremely demanding uh, and they have particular specs for sites. They have to be capable of A, accommodating several hundred megawatts of load with multiple data centers. B, extensive contiguous land for data centers, loading zones, and ciliary buildings. C, they need access to water and they have to run it in the most efficient manner. And D, uh, they have to have a critically sustainable ESG framework. I mean, all these guys want to be able to be out there saying that they're they're sensitive to, to ESG guidelines. Uh, I think TerraWolf is uniquely positioned to fulfill all these requirements. And I would argue no one else out there in the competitive landscape is. Uh, we're able to check the box on all of those on all of those items, which I think is rare, and it positions us for value creation. Um, and 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 our intent is to really evaluate these opportunities. I think there are very few sites left in the United States that have over 50 megawatts. We have 300 megawatts available at Lake Mariner. And we also have land, abundant, cheap, uh, and largely zero carbon power, and plenty of water. Um, last year, um, Nazar uh, led the creation of Wolf Compute as our internal innovation hub. Uh, we're focused on researching, developing, and deploying extensive and scalable digital infrastructure. We have a two megawatt dedicated block of power now. It's part of a much larger initiative. And I think you should expect to hear more on AI and HPC from Terra Wolf in the future. And just a quick follow up there, Paul, you mentioned you have additional access at your existing sites to more power. Are those going to be at the same rates and pricing that we we're currently seeing? Yes. Okay, great. That's why they're talking to us. Have anybody on the show you want. Tell them they've got, find out who's got 300 megawatts and hundreds of acres of land and access on, of water. Um, come back, let me know if you find anybody. We, we know we know the Nautilus contract is a, is a fixed contract for five years. And you've got the opportunity to ex, extend it. At what point during that five years of the discussions, um, or is it just a case of automatically extend at the end of the five years, or discussions have be, before then? And with Lake Mariner, um, is it is it a fixed or is it a market market um, type contract with a price at the moment? 
So uh, contractually, six months prior to the end of the term of that contract is when we would provide an expansion notice. But we do have, I mean, an extension notice. We do have an expansion option, which we've lifted. Uh, and we're talking uh, to the folks there now about increasing uh, our position at Nautilus. Great. And at, and at Lake Mariner, what's what's the, what's the energy? I mean, is it is it more of a market and market price basis there? Yeah, but the, but but again, please remember, Anthony. I own the power at that site, you know, for decades. <laughs> so so there's there is unfortunately a tremendous amount of intimacy and familiarity with electricity pricing at that site, and it's literally it's not even the first exit. It's it's the rest stop before you get to the first exit from all that hydropower coming from up north. So that's where we're at there. And we are, we are blessed with great electricity pricing at Lake Mariner. Tell, tell me you've got two phones in your office. <laughs> when the bat phone rings, <laughs> the power guy comes on. <laughs> yes. I got too many phones, I think, attached to my body. Um, but that's the this joy is, of this is, I suppose this is, my, this is fairly, this is fairly, it's not totally unique, but it's fairly unique in the mining mining area that you know miners have their own power i think stronghold or something you know similar to what they've got as well they can create their own power but that would that's like you know when you're getting to sort of like total uh, vertical integration of having every everything there within your remit uh, under your control effectively that's how you can that's how you can really benefit across against peer miners i would expect that was our thesis and it's our hope and prayer that the market recognizes that in due course yeah no good answer Paul. Hey, shifting gears from the power strategy a little bit, Paul, uh, this was another subscriber question. We've started to hear some rumors in the Bitcoin mining space, specifically from companies that do generate daily cash flow, positive cash flow, uh, looking at potential buybacks or, or special dividends, dividend programs, anything like that. Is that something you guys have discussed or, or we could expect in 2024 at all? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we mine Bitcoin more efficiently and profitably than most of our peers. Uh, and our intent is to return that profit to shareholders in the form of a debt pay down, organic growth, potential future dividends and share buybacks. Post having, uh, assuming Bitcoin stays around uh, current market pricing, will continue to generate a lot of free cash flow. And so my goal is to extinguish the debt extinguish the debt, extinguish the debt with free cash flow. Once we've done that, we can evaluate the most accretive application of our cash and whether we use free cash flow to grow accretively or for dividends or for buybacks. By managing our financial position and deploying resources judiciously, uh, I aim to strike a balance between rewarding shareholders and enabling sustainable long-term growth. Wolf is in it for the long haul, you know, we have, we make money. We have the lowest cost of infrastructure and energy. Uh, we have, you know, balance sheet that's very healthy and a very seasoned management team that's worked together a long time. So we'll be around a long, long time. Uh, we just want to manage the current financial position and resources judiciously. So we could come and tell everybody, Hey, we're done with the debt. Let's move on. Paul, you've, 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 you've announced in the last, you know, the last quarter that, that uh, a, a number of new positions to the board. Can, can you sort of like just give us a very high level, uh, you know, what impact they're bringing to the company in, in, in the time they've been appointed? So I think we uh, have a very distinguished board, um, probably a few too many lawyers on it, but I think they're all smart and give good guidance and advice. Um, we wanted to bring uh, a real leader um, in, in, you know, cybersecurity on board. So we tapped, you know, a government veteran uh, for that recently. Uh, we also brought in uh, a household name in, in the mining space, Amanda Fabiano, uh, who I think is terrific. Um, these folks are, are part of a very active and iterative board process that we have, not just with me, but with all levels of our management. Um, and I think that it's better to have a lot of ideas and come up with the one or two that you really want to pursue than just have my idea and just, you know, I, I just don't want to run things that way. So I love the guidance. Uh, I really appreciate the active participation and all these people, by the way, on the board, uh, I don't think they're 
terribly well paid for their board activity, but um, they're taking their income in the form of stock. So they're they're big believers in Wolf and fully aligned with the shareholders. Yeah, I mean, I've had, I've had the opportunity to meet Amanda, you know, quite a few times. And actually, um, interestingly, we shared the stage with Nazar at the um, at the Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam, which went um, which went well in October last year. So um, I was pleased to see that appointment. Uh, I know what she brings to the space um, with all her background. So. Um, yeah, that was interesting to hear. Yeah, we, we've covered a lot of ground here, Paul, and it, it's very evident how passionate and excited you are about the Wolf story heading into having it next year, the fleet efficiency, the cost per coin, uh, the daily metrics, the revenue. Is there anything we've forgotten in today's discussion that you want to get across to shareholders? You know, unfortunately, it's a competitive landscape, and I need to take every opportunity to try and get our message out. Um, in our recent earnings call, you know, I was asked some questions about that competitive landscape, and I would want to uh, maybe underscore how how important it is that people recognize Wolf um, and start to sort of uh, we start to see a shift in what I consider to be uh, we're, we're clearly undervalued uh, as a public miner. You know, I, I was looking today. Um, I looked at as an example cipher. Um, they don't match our ultra high percentage of zero carbon energy um, and their cost of power and 7.4 exahash of current operational capacity are roughly on par uh, with Wolf. But when you do an adjusted market cap um, for them, you know, after you take away, you know, coin and cash and do the same for us and adjust for debt, um, they're trading at like $190 million per exahash versus Wolf at $90 million per exahash. I mean, our market cap was like $700 million. Theirs is like $1.4 adjusted market cap. To me, you know, I don't understand why somebody would buy, buy at a premium to buy at the lowest value for somebody that's producing, you know, exahash at the lowest most, you know, most competitive cost. When I look at Riot in February, if you think about it, Riot mined 418 Bitcoin, Wolf mined 364. If you exclude cash and Bitcoin holdings, Riot's market cap today stands at approximately 2 billion, whereas ours, again, around 700, a little more than 700 million. So I think that investors in the space, um, aren't looking at value the same way that at least we are. And we hope uh, through messaging our profitability, our margins, uh, that that they'll get there. I mean, if you take a look at 2023, our gross margin was 67% uh, with most miners, well over a billion dollar market cap, barely cutting 40%. I don't think that all exahash is created equal. I didn't think so a year ago. I don't think so today. And I hope that people ultimately join the pack. I mean, I hope they see the wisdom in a business that's run uh, on the basis of making money for our investors. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a common thing, Paul. And, you know, and I, we've, we've had a few CEOs on recently of some of the sort of like the mid-tier, even some of the smaller miners, and they're saying like, you know, you look at the, the big two or three miners up there and the way they're valued and look at how um but it but it, but the numbers speak for themselves and it and, and 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 you've articulated that you know when you look at enterprise value look at hash rate look at value per hash rate and in this in this instance i've been using this metric for 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 you know well over a year now and um you know there's a there's a there's a there's, a, there's, a, there's a distortion between you know, a number of some of the mid-tier miners and, and you know, effectively two of the largest miners out there at the moment. You know, Clean Spark and Marathon's, you know, you mentioned, you know, right there, but Clean Spark and Marathon, um, it's over $200 a terahash. Um, and their market capitalization just doesn't seem to be stopping. You know, yes, they've done they've done things well, but there's no there's no sort of like consistency in the, in the sort of like the mining space of how these companies are. And now that there's the advent of other other sort of like business models coming into play, you've articulated the AI and the HPC side that you could, you know, maybe move into there. We're talking about big expansions. 
I don't think some of these are factored in. They can't be factored in, you know. Um, and, and I don't think it's that hard, Anthony. Again, you know, the simplest job is we, we, we get a, on the call every morning at 9 o'clock, the executive team. And all we talk about is profitability, profitability, profitability. And a shareholder should want to buy. I, I mean, I'm a shareholder. I want to buy a company that is profitable. I want to be able to define how they make money, what are their costs, what is their margin, and then I'm an investor or not. And I think that we have a space that should be defined on the back of profitability and nothing else. Because if you're profitable um, and you're transparent, then you should want to own that company. And it is my hope that people like you will get that message out there and sort of commoditize an investment approach. I do know post having that will be much easier because you know yeah. you'll be out you'll be one of these multi-billion dollar market cap miners that are losing money mining and at some point you know unless you're just completely disrespectful to the shareholders you'll take that crappy exa hash offline right we will be mining we will be mining everything we are mining today because we will continue to make money and more money than anyone else bitcoin mining no, good, good points and well presented there. Um, just, just to sort of like hit, coming to the end of the end of the conversation, um, a, a lot of the miners have sort of like been sort of like hit by the short interest in recent in recent weeks. I mean, you, you've already articulated, you know, internally you own over forty percent of the company. Um, that, I mean, I mean, there has been some short action against against her. Well, is that something you're able to sort of like? You know, is it, is it a threat to you or is it, a, is it something that, you know, it, you, it's not over, an over concern that you're discussing? So I don't think it's a threat to us. I mean, because we're doing, we make so much money mining, it's, it's not a threat. I mean, to be honest, and on a personal level, you want those people to ultimately regret having made yeah. the choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but from a business perspective, I would tell you that um, I think 70% of the short interest is, is held in one fund. At least that's what I'm advised. Uh, I think um, if it's one of the f one or two, you know, likely candidates, I think what they used to do is run around to, to public miners, offer to lend them money, take an amazing amount of warrant coverage at a discount, and then they used Wolf to short, you know, because they're long warrants on all these other miners. So I think that will work through the system at some point um, as people start to see, wow, they're really undervalued relative to, to the field. I think um, separately, um, there was, of course, the long Bitcoin ETF, you know, short miners trade. And so we had already um, suffered from the original strategy. I think we got caught up in that. But I, I think Jason Assad, Chloe, Patrick Fleury, Kerry, Nazar, you know, we're trying to get out there more and more and more. I think it's 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 getting some traction. People are starting to say, wow, they make money. And again, if anyone else says they make money, push them, challenge them to prove it. I promise you, you could get Patrick on the show. He will identify where we spent money on, you know, on water for the office cooler. I mean, <laughs> There is not a cost that is not identified in how we demonstrate margin. I, I could so, well believe that, Paul. I, I, I've, I've spoken to Patrick on a number of calls, and he's and, and actually, to, and, and, and the good thing is, is from Patrick's perspective, he's he's well recognised in this space. You know, from, from you know from other companies as well. He's he's got a he's got a great background, and he was an asset when he joined joined your company. Um, I've known him for I'm, years. I mean, years and years we've worked together. It's totally painful. I mean, he's like a best friend, but it's just painful. The level of detail that he insists that we put out there because he believes at the end of the day, profitability will rule the space and transparency has to govern it. And so if, if we could achieve those, those two goals at the highest level, ultimately, you know, we'll hopefully be sitting around talking about Wolf in 20 years. And you know, I think, over, I think to, to answer it, Paul, you know, the, you, you know, you, you think there's not interest out there. there. There's there's definitely interest in in the wolf pack out there. I mean, we're seeing this on on social media. I, I reached out recently and I got some like two thousand responses, and I looked at the tables 
and you were drawing as many as many uh, people had Wolf in their in their top three uh, mining investments alongside the likes of Riot and Marathon. There's a couple of miners that had you know a few more, but we're not talking big big differences. But you know there were some miners that didn't have any representation in, in the top three, but you had significant amounts. You were alongside the likes of your likes of Riot, likes of Marathon. Um, but there's a couple of miners that had, you know, maybe a couple of more. But you, you're certainly you're certainly talked about as a company, um, you know. And actually, if you look at the amount of questions that we've uh, received for this podcast, I think we received more questions for this podcast than we have done for some of the other podcasts. So that that tells you the people are sending questions in. They're shareholders. They're not just anyone just sending. Oh, let's send Paul a, a question. They're con- you know they're sending they're sending question because they want to know, understand more. And you're here communicating, you know, that position and also, ex- you know, explaining where the company's going in, and explaining it well, where the company's going over the next 18 months. Well, I don't want to fail them. And I ultimately believe that if we keep our heads down and we execute and remember, Anthony, we have the infrastructure that no one else has. So we have the low cost energy that no one else has. We have the zero carbon strategy that nobody else has. And we have a team that's been focused on energy infrastructure and has been together. Nazar and I are together over 20 years. Carrie and I, 15. Stephanie and I, 15. Patrick and I, a decade. I mean, this is a team that has worked together building out energy infrastructure in the most competitive way. And so I'm grateful for the opportunity to get on here and I, I hope I've answered your questions in a way that's satisfactory to our investors. Um, and I hope I could change some minds because again, if you believe in transparency and you want to invest in a company that makes money mining, buy Wolf. If you want to just own Bitcoin, buy an ETF, sell Mara, sell Clean Spark, sell Riot, buy an ETF. But if you want to be with a company that makes money mining, please call up Jason Assad and get involved. A great way to close the video out. Um, Paul, I'll kick it back to you for any closing thoughts if you have anything else. You guys, if you're still watching the video at this point, thanks so much. Hit the like button. It helps push this content to other people like you who may find value. If you're not part of the channel, McNally Money, feel free to join. We'd love to have you as part of the community. Uh, Paul, I'll kick it back to you for closing thoughts. Maybe we'll get a wolf howl out of you to close the... Uh, do you do any I'm howling much, around there? I'm not much of a howler, but no. A, I look forward to Anthony's Stop selling the HODL strategy for Bitcoin miners. It's not the right strategy. Monetize, 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 make money, be profitable. Follow me or follow the company on Twitter. And I am grateful for your interest. So thank you. There you have it. Next video, we'll do a, a boxing match between you and Anthony, Paul, the HODL, HODL fight. One of that. <laughs> uh, he's already convinced. He, he wrote me a secret message. He said, I'm totally out on the HODL. Let's go drinking together. So I'm all in. Sounds I'm, good. I'm, Paul, Paul, in all honesty, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on the side of the HODL. I just, we, we had a podcast about what, what the impact is to those companies. So I've been very clear over the last couple of years with the likes of, you know, you guys and actually... CleanSpark were a seller of Bitcoin all through the 2021, 2022. It's just this last sort of like year where they've realized, you know, they want to start say, building up a HODL position. Um, and it's great. The HODL's great when it's when the, when the Bitcoin price is flying through the sky. And it's, you know, it's nice to have that. But when it turns, and it turned in 2021, how many of those miners were left holding themselves when the Bitcoin price dropped to 15,000? Some were buying Bitcoin and then selling Bitcoin at a loss. It was like, you know, so I've... I've never been a fan of the, of the of the HODL. There is two strategies, and I'm not going to turn around and say, you know, one's far better than the other one. The, the, the HODLers will put up an equal and opposite argument to that. All I do is I just articulate, you know, there is I, two strategies. I don't strategies. know how they put up an equal and uh, a competitive they'll, they'll put, they'll put, they'll put up, yeah. They'll, they'll put up, yeah, they'll put up their own argument, you know, in, 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 a, in a way that you've, you, you, you've argued for the fact that, you know, by... By utilizing that that that, uh, that the selling of the Bitcoin on a daily basis is accretive to but you guys. Anthony, let me close by saying this. Again, we started as an energy infrastructure company. We're going to be an energy infrastructure company until the end of time. The question is, how do you get the highest value out of that energy infrastructure? You get it by mining Bitcoin and possibly by looking at some of these high-speed computing applications. That's the business that we're in. I don't have a group that knows how to speculate on the price of Bitcoin. 
I, you know, I, I could call Mike, I could get his view, but at the end of the day, that's not a business for me. I run a company that mines Bitcoin, converts electricity into Bitcoin. I run a company that converts electricity into what can be high speed computing and data centers. That's what we do. And so we're going to lead that effort, stay close to that effort, be true to that effort and report to you profits and transparently. There we have it. Profits, transparency, and $37,000 post-having. That's the number that sticks out of the, the conversation for me, Paul. Thanks so much for your time. You guys, feel free to leave a comment in the section if we didn't address or get to your point. And Paul, thanks again so much for being here. Thank you, guys. Great to see you. Thank you very much. Cool.